know the numbers difficult to study there so right we'll, we'll kick off so welcome to this evening's uh digital support group for glaucoma i'm pleased to welcome jonathan clark of moorfields eye hospital and a member of the dvla drivers medical panel for vision um he's going to be talking about glaucoma and driving so before we kick off i just want to do a little mini tour of zoom for anyone who hasn't attended before um, if you wiggle your mouse or touch your screen, depending on if you're using a computer or a um, uh, or, or a lap tablet, there should be some options that come up at the bottom. The most important one is the Q and A. So if you click on that, that should open, um, and that's where if you have any questions um, for Jonathan or myself at any point in the evening, you can post your questions there. We can see it. We'll be keeping an eye on it. Um, uh to, to to sort of yeah for the q a at the end um even if you don't think you're going to ask questions you can vote up that you can sort of like the questions that you that you like um and that will sort of push it up to the top of the list so if there's a question that you can see there that you think is particularly interesting and you really want to hear that answered um then uh click like on that or comment on it sort of add your add your um thoughts as well and we can respond um yeah, to, to sort of which ones seem the most popular. I can see someone's hand is up. Um, you, I don't know whether that was a mis mistake. You can lower your hand at any point. Um, that's another option in Zoom. Um, if uh, the person who has raised their hand, um, perhaps Roshenda could just check if you're okay or you can lower your hand. If you um, don't like typing, if you're quite slow at typing, but you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand at any point. Um, and someone can sort of message you to, to say, do you want to ask a question out loud? And then we can unmute you and you can um, ask your question live if you find typing quite difficult. Um, I'm just going to launch a poll now, um, which is just a little test of sort of how much you, you know, how much you feel you know about glaucoma and tonight's topic and, and us as an organisation. So that's just been launched. That will run for for about 10 minutes till I remember to take it off um, and then we'll, we'll ask the same questions at the end so you might be able to see that that poll has now launched um, you can just just answer that to see um, what we get from um, what you get out of this evening so just really briefly my some of you may know me quite well by now because I think a few of you I can see some familiar names in the in the list of attendees my name is Joanna Bradley I am head of support services at Glaucoma UK my role is to make sure that everyone with glaucoma gets the, the sort of support and information and advice that they need um, either directly from us or through the professionals that we engage with. So just a really quick summary, I don't want to bore the people who, um, who've attended a few of these webinars before. Let me just share my screen quickly. So hopefully you can see that. So Glaucoma UK was known as the International Glaucoma Association until just a few weeks ago. Um, we do three, three sort of strands of activity. So campaigning and awareness to raise awareness of glaucoma as a, as a, as a condition, as a disease, and encourage people to get their eyes tested. Um, and we provide advice and support for people with glaucoma so they can live well with the condition and um, look after their eyes and, and sort of retain useful vision for life. That's what we want. And our third strand of activity is that we fund research into um, the causes of glaucoma, um, diagnosis, treatment, prevention. Um, not a huge amount of money, but it, it sort of keeps it ticking over and fund a certain amount of kind of initial funding for, for researchers um, to, into the causes and treatment of glaucoma. So, Without further ado, I'm now going to pass us um, pass over to Jonathan. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming to speak this evening, um, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Joanna. And I am hoping to share my slide. Joe, can you see that? And can you hear me? Uh, yep. Yep. That looks good. Yep. Great. OK, thank you. Well, it's just wonderful to have so many people join us on a lovely evening. I'm grateful for everyone for giving up your time to come and uh, hear me talk about uh, driving and glaucoma. I've called this talk the impact of glaucoma, driving and glaucoma. And I'm going to um, talk about what, 
how glaucoma affects vision, how that influences our ability to drive. I'm going to talk about some of the research and where there are some contentious issues. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the regulations and demonstrate some of the charts that the DVLA used to make their decision about who can drive and who can't drive. And then um, Joe will just go through at the end a little bit about how one can appeal if you feel that um, you've not managed to do your best effort and have not managed to achieve what you want to do through the DVLA. And if you look at my first slide, you'll see there's a few bullet points. And then at the bottom of some of my slides, you'll see uh, in small print a reference. And that's a reference to one of the statements I'm making. So if you wanted to look into this a bit more and read a bit more around the subject, then you could pull up these references from um, some of the journals if you if you have the ability to do that. Uh, a lot of them are available through um, open access uh, and at least the uh, abstract my first statement is that many patients with glaucoma feel they're safe to drive and in fact nine out of ten folks with glaucoma are able to drive they are deemed safe to drive by the dvla but i would say in my, in my experience that people are very surprised to be informed by the driving regulator that they don't meet the standard they perceive that actually their vision is entirely safe to drive and they are very surprised that they've been told that that's not the case and this really goes back a little bit to what glaucoma is and how it affects us and one third of patients have unnoticed early visual loss in glaucoma we're really unaware of glaucoma in in the early stages it's not until it becomes a more advanced disease that we start becoming aware of the effect of it the World Health Organization uh, published this report, <clears throat> the World Report on Road Traffic Injury Prevention. And one of their uh, opening paragraphs on poor road user eyesight stated that a single error ca can have life or death consequences. Behind road user errors, there are natural limitations. These include uh, vision in night traffic, the detection of uh, targets in the periphery of the eye, the estimation of speed and distance, the processing of information of the brain, etc. But I thought two parts of that really stand out, and that is a single error can have life or death consequences. And the fact that uh, detection of targets in the periphery of the vision or of the eye are so important for how we uh, maintain safety on the roads. <clears throat> And why does it matter? Well, um, mobility outside the home is cited as one of the two most important visual functions by subjects with glaucoma. And uh, driving is the primary means of transport among elderly in the USA and in rural areas. Uh, we're lucky in London where I live that we've got a good public transport, but uh, being able to drive really does lead to a loss of freedom for many people. When we did a patient day at Moorfields, we asked all of the participants to take a yellow sticker and place it in the box that they thought was most relevant. The one area in which my life has been most affected by glaucoma is. And the fear of losing vision was the overwhelming winner, but in second place came driving. So driving and glaucoma is a significant issue. Uh, the picture of the gentleman there is Bob Weinrep. He's an American glaucoma specialist who's done an awful lot of research as well. And he came up with this arch, which he called the glaucoma continuum. And, and there's a lot of detail in there. But if you look at the large colored blocks, they are undetectable disease on the far left, then asymptomatic disease in the central block, and then functional impairment on the far right. And the the point of this arch is to show that you can go from normal on the far left, as in no sign of any disease, and then various steps have to take place in the process before any of the disease changes are detectable with any of our technologies, be that scans or visual fields. 
And it's only when you get to the last bar, which is the functional impairment, what that means is that you as an individual are aware of your disease having an effect on your vision that, um, uh, you know, you can see how far down the uh, continuum you've got for that. And probably where the first arrow is and one of the first things that you might identify is, is driving. Uh, so it's actually, although it feels early to the, to the individual, it's actually quite late in the disease when you sadly lose the ability to drive. <clears throat> I saw one of Joe's questions was about what is glaucoma and I'm not going to concentrate on what glaucoma is, but I, I'd just like to show some pictures of the nerves at the back of the eye and just present it through the field of vision related to the nerves at the back of the eye. I've got my little pointer, which I know is not that easy to see, but the nerve on the right hand side labelled left optic nerve has got a lovely pink rim of nerve tissue and a small central pale cup. And in glaucoma, that cup enlarges, it's called cupping, and we lose the rim of nerve tissue. So the fellow eye here labelled the right optic nerve, hopefully you can see has got a thinner rim of nerve tissue and a larger central cup. So this right eye has glaucoma whilst the left eye is essentially <clears throat> normal. And if we look at that individual's visual field tests, these are the grayscales of the visual field for that individual. And the one labeled left has the normal blind spot, but really very little else that I would consider abnormal. Whilst on the right area, there's these big dark swathes, which are not what the patients see, but that's the uh, computer algorithm's way of demonstrating very poor sensitivity to light in those parts of the peripheral vision. This doesn't really show what it's like to have glaucoma, it just demonstrates the extent of the disease process for monitoring. So attempts have been made to try and show what it's actually like to have glaucoma in a field defect, and this rather mocked up picture, I think it's a real life picture taken by Anne Holst, shows um, two rather enthusiastic children chasing a ball across um, fortunately what looks like a very quiet road uh, in a residential area. And down the bottom left is the visual field of that individual for one eye, which is essentially normal. So that individual who's probably looking at the center of that silver car between the ball and the children would be expected to pick up all of these other ongoing issues in the periphery. But Anne tried to relate what it might be like to have glaucoma as the visual field defect increased. So bottom left, you can see some dark areas on the visual field. In other words, where the light hasn't been picked up on the visual field analyzer. And Although the picture looks quite reasonable, we can see that the children have all but disappeared, just the top of the crown remaining of the small child. And what the brain's done is sort of filled in the gaps with what it believes might be there, which is just a continuation of the road and perhaps the side of the car. Um, as glaucoma progresses and the next visual field looks a lot more severe, there's very little that's really being picked up here, apart from very central vision. The children have now gone completely, but on, in general, that doesn't look too abnormal. Perhaps the windows over here are a little bit more stretched and Gothic looking. Um, there's obviously some blurring here as well, but it's, it's not the complete blackout that some of these pictures might suggest. So that's one sort of representation about how loss of peripheral vision might be perceived by someone who was uh, walking, just walking down the street and looking straight where that yellow dot in the center is. And that explains why people with glaucoma often find people knocking into them. Because as we go back here, these folks, these children are really quite close to being in front of you, yet they're not really visible. They would have to move more centrally before they were seen by, um, uh, by that patient. Um, so there's been some research done by David Crabb at City uh, University, where he's induced a visual field defect related to glaucoma in a healthy volunteers. 
you can see the blurred area that he's filled in here. He's tried to sort of replicate what the shape of the slope might be of that part of the road, driving down a motorway. And in this situation, one can move one's eyes, look around, but this visual field defect remains persistent based on how they try to set up the optics. It's a bit difficult, but they've tried to do some research. This is the actual image, and you can see there's a car at the bottom left here about to join the motorway. And if, if you have this sort of area of field loss, then quite a lot of the participants actually missed that car joining the road during the, um, the, the artificial run that they did in, in trying to demonstrate what um, vision with um, a visual field defect and driving would be like. So we managed just about in research to demonstrate what a visual field defect is like and how it can affect your quality of your, read, of your vision. Sorry. I've tried to demonstrate what is how you can just the brain can fill in gaps with what's a bit of a challenge here. It's difficult to do it over Zoom, but if you were to look with both eyes open at this small white dot and be aware of all these leaves in the background, I've got down in the bottom here, bottom left, an area where there's no information. In other words, there's there's a visual field defect effectively. And if you carefully look at the dot and perhaps try not to blink, but just stare very straight at it, what you'll notice after a few seconds, at least you may notice, is that that gray box down the bottom left just starts to fill in and disappear. That's the brain saying, that shouldn't be there. I'm going to put in there what I think should be there. I'm hoping some of you will be able to pick that up. I hope that's not too difficult. If you did it with one eye open, closed one eye, you might find it more straightforward. I've also tried to do a slightly more ambitious version here, where there is a typical defect that one might find in glaucoma. And again, I found that I could stare at that small dot on the right, and if I really focus carefully on it, something strange happens with my vision in that peripheral area, and it starts to fill in. It's a bit disconcerting, um, but that's totally normal for that to happen. And that, what I'm trying to demonstrate is an explanation as to why it is that when you have a defect in your field of vision, you're not always aware of it because of how clever the brain is in trying to fill in those areas. <laughs> well, going back to some of David Crabb's work, and here we've got a, another simulation uh, of a car driving along a road, and I'm playing it on a loop, so it's going back to the end and then it's playing again. The red dots represent people who don't have glaucoma, and there's one individual who does have glaucoma and a constricted field of vision. You'll notice that there's a woman just pushing her pram across the road on the side there. And as we go past, a lot of the red dots look towards that because it's obviously a hazard that one needs to take attention, pay attention of. But the blue dot stays rather resolutely locked onto the car in front, not really picking up these cues, not picking up the lorry parked on the side there. So this was a simulated attempt to try and demonstrate what driving with a peripheral visual field defect, how it might influence your ability to drive. <clears throat> so I thought I'd just have a look at the evidence that visual loss from glaucoma affects driving, uh, because after all, if we're going to say it's not safe to drive, then we need to have some evidence to, to um, come to that conclusion. And um, the Salisbury Eye Evaluation was a population survey, survey where they asked people questions and then examined them and looked for uh, undiagnosed uh, diseases or known diseases. And discontinuation of driving was significantly more frequent in patients with glaucoma in both eyes, but not in one eye compared to healthy subjects. And compared to people with glaucoma, patients with glaucoma in both eyes more frequently reported vision-related discontinuation of driving at night, vision-related decrease driving frequency, and vision-related cessation of driving in unfamiliar areas. And again, anecdotally, many of my patients really take that technique forward to how they try to drive safely, uh, even if they have passed the DVLA 
uh, tests, but they still modify their driving uh, accordingly. Unfortunately, the DVLA doesn't have categories of driving license where you can have a limited driving license for certain conditions, but not in other conditions. Um, another clinical study uh, report that drivers with moderate bilateral, so affecting both visual fields, were more likely to report at least some difficulties with all driving tasks investigated compared to patients with mild or no fields, uh, uh, field loss detected, sorry, field defects in both eyes. <clears throat> A rather busy slide. Um, accident rates. So an analysis of accident rates amongst those with glaucoma provide mixed evidence of an association. So I say mixed because some studies do find an association and others don't. Those that did, uh, glaucoma subjects have a threefold increase in the odds, in other words, the likelihood of a state reported, it's a US state reported accident when compared to controls without glaucoma. And a case control study, so where they looked at individuals who had glaucoma versus those that didn't, found higher crash rates with worsening levels of glaucoma visual field loss. And high rates of vehicle accidents among glaucoma subjects when compared to controls. So people with controls are those that don't have glaucoma. So quite a large increased risk over six times greater risk. However, well, some studies don't agree with that. So another study found that crash rates were not higher in women with glaucoma, whilst when men with glaucoma had only a slightly higher rate of state-related, state-recorded accidents. And one report even noted fewer state-recorded accidents among individuals with glaucoma. So we don't have really strong evidence to back up our decisions, but we have, I think, enough to say that there's uh, we have to draw the line somewhere as far as your extent of one's visual field defect. But this comes with an impact. And studies have shown that elderly persons who stop driving are five times more likely to move to a long-term care facility, a care home. Having higher rates of depression and reporting a lower quality of life. So removing someone's ability to drive has a huge effect on their overall well-being and welfare. So as ophthalmologists, we have a responsibility to inform our patients about the DVLA rules uh, for driving standards. So we ask our patients to inform the DVLA when they have glaucoma, when there are visual field defects affecting both eyes. So you can safely drive with a field defect in one eye, but when both eyes are affected, then the DVLA need to know about it. The DVLA provide a, a weighty document on assessing fitness to drive. It goes through cardiac and um, neurological, but also visual, re, um, visual uh, classification about how who's safe to drive and what the terms and conditions are about who can drive. And I'm listing here, um, I'll list in a moment all the long classifications. I won't go them through them all in detail because they're quite technical and they require quite a lot of understanding of their visual field test, which I'm going to show now. That's different from the one we do in clinic for glaucoma screening. It's with both eyes open. It's called the Esterman visual field test. <clears throat> uh, it, as I say, it's done with both eyes open. It checks a much larger area of the field of vision than we do in the glaucoma clinic, mainly because glaucoma tends to affect that mid peripheral vision rather than the very far peripheral vision. And there's, there's various bits of information about the patient's age, the type of test all at the top, how reliable that, that test was. And then at the bottom, there's a, a, a sort of scale as to how many uh, have been seen, how many of the lights were seen, how many were not seen. Not seen are shown as these black, uh, black squares and seen are shown as these empty small circles or ovals. Um, so that's the data, that's what the DVLA make their decision on. And this is when uh, you go to Specsavers because they have the contract at the moment. When you go to Specsavers and have your field test done, it's this test, it's different from what we do in the clinic. Mm. So I've got here a very long list of different requirements for group one being, dry, being um, car drivers, uh, one, 
two, three, three slides, and then group two being the bus and lorry drivers, which are more stringent. And I don't really see any great benefit of going through these in great detail because they are they are quite, as I say, quite technical, but I'm, I've put them in here in case for the questioning, we want to come back and have a look at them in more detail. I wasn't sure what folks would like to know. But what I'm going to show you here is the important area, and that's within these this blue shape that I've drawn here. These for a car driver are the, are the dots that need to be seen, at least the majority of dots that need to be seen. And you don't have to get every single uh, spot seen, but if you have a cluster of uh, more than three that are not seen, uh, then that's enough for the DVLA to decide, certainly in the central 20 degrees, that you don't meet the standard. And you have to be able to go out to at least 50 degrees on one side and a total of 120 degrees, with each of these marks being 10 degrees, out from the centre. So you can go 60 on this side and 60 on this side, or 50 on this side and 70 on that side. And that's That's your standard then met. If I go back to our um, patient who we looked at earlier with glaucoma, you can see that we only test out really to the central 30 degrees with our visual field test here. So it's difficult for us to predict when we just look at a set of visual fields whether an individual is going to meet the standards or not, although we can get some idea certainly for those cent central 20 degrees. Um, and also this is individualized, we've got the right eye and the left eye. So we haven't got something that merges them together. It is possible to do that, but not with the visual field analyzers that we've got. If you're really clever, like what my colleague, Mr. Viswanathan, he's taken this individual's left eye with arrowed quite, quite significant visual field defects, and then the patient's right eye, again, with further visual field defects. And then he said, there were, I can't see any overlap there, and then try to merge the fields together like that. And you can see the bits that are not picked up with both eyes open. And actually that top left area is not nearly as significantly affected up here as uh, perhaps down here is and over here. Uh, so you can see it's quite difficult from single field test to make that decision about who meets the criteria and who doesn't. All right, the estimate field test prints out in various different ways. Uh, here's another, just another different printout from a different visual field analyzer. Um, going back to the Humphrey field analyzer, uh, the DVLA will look at it and they'll draw patterns around the parts that are not picked up. Uh, so this individual would not meet the class two cl classification, but sees enough dots within the central area that I was referring to to make it just to pass. They go out to 50 on this side, but they don't go to 60, which is here. So these black dots mean they haven't seen out to 60. And they go all the way along here to 70. So that's the 120 that's required. You've got the odd defect here and here within the central area, but that's permitted. <laughs> and then out around the central 20 degrees, there's, as I say, just the one missing. and it, you um, you can you can have one one or two dots missing and still pass the criteria. Um, here's a group two driver where I haven't demonstrated uh, anything else here, but just to show that there's quite a lot of scattered defects and these wouldn't be enough uh, for uh, a driver to meet the group two license, but they wouldn't meet the group group one license. Um, here's another patient of mine actually who obviously I've anonymized it but she has quite advanced glaucoma but fortunately she doesn't have uh, overlapping visual field defects in the area that's required and I've magnified that area up for us here so you can see that she actually gets all the points right in that central zone that's required so DVLA would have no problem with her and they would probably give her a three-year license um, my responsibility is to ask her to tell the DVLA if I find that her glaucoma deteriorates, but if it remains stable, then she'll be fine for the next three years. Uh, here's another example where you can see there's these four defects in the top, the black splodges. So that's not compatible with passing the DVLA driving uh, uh, assessment. So this would be unfortunately a fail for this individual in the DVLA. 
Fine. So I've whizzed through that and I'm hoping there'll be lots of questions that I can answer. But in summary, I think glaucoma remains a common cause for people losing their driving license. But to put it in perspective, 90% of patients with glaucoma do keep their license. So it's a small minority, but because glaucoma is a common condition, it's still a significant number of individuals. I think the rules are complex for passing the DVLA test and they're not easily predictable. <coughs> Certainly when we see individuals in clinic, it's difficult for us to predict from our standard glaucoma visual field tests. Uh, the DVLA arranges the Esteman field test and then they make the decision. So it's all out of our hands. Unfortunately, there's no representation from us that can really make a difference one way or the other. Um, but it is possible to appeal and at least repeat the test. So if you felt you did a had a poor effort or the setup of the room wasn't right, or there was just something about how you did your test that meant that you really didn't give yourself uh, the best chance that you could have done, then there are um, ways in which you can have the test repeated either by, normally by going to see your, optom your optometrist. And I, I think Joe's going to go through some of those, uh, some of those potential uh, routes for, for getting the test repeated and what you can do to appeal. Uh, I know that it's on the uh, Glaucoma UK website, but I'm going to hand over to Jo now just for her a uh, few words and then we'll go to questions. Great, thank you um, yeah, for that really interesting talk. Nice videos and, and sort of really, really powerful graphics about um, how uh, the impact of, of glaucoma on driving. So as Jonathan says, I'm just going to talk really briefly about some of the kind of appeal statistics. Um, bear with me, I can see there's some questions coming in, so I'll discuss the talk quite quickly through this. Um, is that, yeah. So just a few kind of really high level um, summary statistics. There's about 120,000 people as of 2019 who have told the DVLA that they have glaucoma and still have their license. Um, and as, as Jonathan's already said, um, around 12% of Group 2 drivers um, have their uh, license refused or revoked. That's commercial drivers, but only about 5% of Group 1 drivers um, lose their license. And this, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a weird graph here. So I'm trying to work out the best way to show it. But in, in the last five years, so Group One drivers, that's normal drivers, that's not commercial drivers. Um, so, so so many people were were refused or revoked that of this sort of five percent. Twenty nine percent of them reapplied for their license, and of that twenty nine percent of people who reapplied for their license, sixty two percent of those people got their license back. So if you decide that you want to reapply for your license, you've got kind of based on past um, past statistics, kind of 62% chance of, of getting it back. Now, obviously that depends on your particular visual field. You, it, you know, it depends on, as, as Jonathan was just explaining, like where the issues are, where the defects are and, and how they're aligned, but kind of of all the people who, who reapply, 62% will, um, will get the license back. So, just so you know, we work quite closely with the DLA now. They they sort of they 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 really do want to get it right for both the safety of the roads. So obviously, they're responsible for for kind of making sure that the, the the drivers on the road are safe, and they've got to look after that kind of public health. But they also do want to try and get that that sort of experience right for anyone who has a med medical condition, and um. And is having to tell the DVLA about it and sort of notify it. So they, they've started giving us some of this information about that sort of journey through the DVLA for people who are telling the DVLA about their glaucoma. So this is the typical journey for someone who's notifying the DVLA for the first time. So this is you've just been told you've got glaucoma, so you're telling the DVLA um, as you should that you have glaucoma. Um, and just to remind you, if you have if you're just a normal driver, not a commercial driver, you only need to tell the DVLA when you have glaucoma in both eyes. Um, if you're a commercial driver, you have to tell them when you just have it in one. That's the standards are higher. So you've just been told you're doing the right thing. So you're telling the DVLA. The DVLA will then contact the, 
GP and or the, the consultant, probably the consultant in this case, um, for a bit more um, information. Um, and, and you'll also do the kind of estimate test at Specsavers, as Jonathan was saying. Um, and that whole journey takes about 46 days. Now, this was pre-COVID, so the numbers have probably changed a bit, um, but kind of when things go back to normal. So it will take about a month and a half for the, the, the sort of test to be done at Specsavers, um, if needed, to um, contact the, the consultant. And then, yeah, so 93% of people will get their license back. Only 4% of people will um, lose their license. So revoked is if it's taken off you and refused is if it's not issued, just to, to sort of say you understand those two words. Um, and then about 2% of people actually say, do you know what, maybe it's time for me to, to kind of uh, to, to say goodbye to my driving license myself. So this is people who've decided they don't want to continue the application. So you know, if you think about these two statistics, 93% of people get their license and only 4% of people then when they're first telling the DBLA. And the numbers actually aren't terribly different. This slide's slightly different. It's people who haven't, they have previously told the DBLA and maybe been given a three-year license or a one-year license. Um, and you can see the, the, the um, typical journey is a bit quicker because you're kind of in the system already. Um, and um, the, but the numbers are pretty similar, so you've still got a pretty good chance of um, retaining the license. So, you know, really the, the kind of the odds are in your favour, hopefully you should be OK. So in terms of how it works, if you if you get your license refused or revoked, you're in that kind of three or four percent of people who, who, who have been unlucky and you, you don't accept the decision. You can pay for a second visual field test to be done at an optician of your choice. So you can go to your normal one if you've um, if you, you sort of found that the experience at uh, Specsavers you you don't want to repeat for whatever reason, you can choose which optometrist you go to. And if necessary, you can request um, additional medical information. Um, and then the DVLA will look at all of that. And then they might well send you for a second Specsavers visual field test. They will pay for this. You've had to pay for the first one. They'll pay for the second one um, and then they will um, have a look at this. So, um, yeah, that's that. That's that process. Let me just look at the statistics for that. So that's where the statistics are actually quite, quite promising, as I as I showed you before. So this. Um, yeah, this is the, the slide that matters. So over the years, you can see the people who were reapplied and um, were sent for another visual field test, you can see the blue is all of the people who were then issued with a license. So, you know, really good chance based on the, the law of averages that you, you will get your license back and only a small, um, a smaller proportion, that's the orange, of people who, um, who don't get the license back. Um, yeah, you can reapply, um, you have to pay for the visual field test, you send it off to the DVLA. Um, and they will have a look to see what they can do. If you're still not happy with that decision, if the DVLA come back and um, say, no, like, no, we, we, we stand by our decision, you can't have your licence, um, you can accept that, or you can decide to do a formal appeal. Now, the rules are quite sort of specific about that, and it's different in England, Wales and Northern Ireland compared to Scotland. So England, Wales, Northern Ireland, you've got six months. Um, to lodge that, you send that to the magistrate's court or a sheriff in Scotland. You don't really have very long in Scotland to do it. Um, this uh, can get quite quite expensive, this um, formal appeal process. You'd be responsible for the cost if you lose. And um, the odds are not as encouraging. Sorry, I'm scanning through the slide. So if you look, um, not many people take it to um, formal appeal actually because of the, the sort of costs um, and you can see that there's not many on there that where people have been successful at a formal appeal so if you've sort of done the informal appeal where you just send another field test off that's where you, you stand quite a good chance of getting your license back if you're unsuccessful at that stage um, it is possibly time to accept um, you need to you know you shouldn't be driving for various reasons but these numbers, now I don't quite know how up to date these numbers are. I think they were pulled together by a colleague a couple of years ago. But if you do lose your license, 
um, the cost of running your car by the time you've paid for tax, insurance, fuel, breakdown cover, and the kind of initial purchase price and depreciation in value of your car, it works out on average about 60 quid a week. So if you um, think that you're, um, you know, if you if you sort of aren't paying that 60 quid a week to, to run your car, um, by the time you've got all of those costs, um, you can sort of put that towards your, your taxes and your bus fare and things, and, and depending how much travel you do, you, you know, it could easily be that it's cheaper to get your, your taxi to the supermarket every week um, than it would be to run a car for the, for the year as a whole, um, is sort of average cost. So that was super quick. Just to um, reiterate, if you want to see any of our slides that we've used today, I know so someone's messaged about the references um, and would like to sort of look them up. Do email me um, on j.bradley at glaucoma.org. I'm the one that's been sending you all the emails about the, about the webinars. Um, send an email to me, we'll make a note and we'll send you a PDF copy of those slides if you're interested. Um, so yeah, get in touch if you want to see any of that information so i think there's a lot of questions um coming in so the first one that's um is it was inevitable let's be honest my experience of testing at spec savers was bad lots of people have had this experience before have talked to us about this so fields done in a small room busy shop customers wandering around no door or curtain um, difficult, really difficult conditions. So what can the DVLA do to ensure that field tests at spec savers are held in a dark and quiet and appropriate setting? What is generally managed? Jonathan, what do you think can happen? Well, I think first of all, DVLA need to know about this. So they need to be informed that that's the case. Now, I thought there was a formal feedback that um, folks do when they go there, but if, that, but if that's not the case, then and then the med driver's medical need to be informed that this was, you know, just not not a good setup at all. It was a disappointing, for whatever reasons it were. Because the more DVLA know about the experience that we have there, then the, the more they can feed back to Specsavers and tighten up. And it's a contract in the end. Specsavers have won this contract so that they can uh, provide the provide the service, and they're being paid a lot of money. Actually, this tax. Tax band has saved a lot of money by going through spec savers as well. So that, that's the reason it was done, I suppose. But, um, there's also been other benefits from having it done because it's now become electronic and everything is uploaded quite quickly. So there have been some benefits of going to one supplier and, and having more unified systems put in place. But if it's they're all franchises, so there's quite a lot of variation. And if, you, if you've got a bad experience in one place, then DVLA need, need to know about it because they'll feed that back to spec savers. And if there's a cluster of reports like that, then that's very powerful. And just to reiterate, it's always helpful for us to know about that as well, if you are um, having poor experiences at different shops. Because as I said, we do work we do work with spec savers, uh, DVLA well, and spec savers, and, and they listen. They, they Both organisations want to get it right. So if you... Um, if you send anything to the DBLA, let us know as well, and we can collate that and sort of send comments and queries through to both DBLA and spec savers. So don't don't feel that you're kind of suffering in silence. Um, we we will sort of petition at a kind of organisational level to, to help people um, with that process. So next question. Um, this I think this is linked to COVID, where obviously the contract between Specsavers and DVLA is currently suspended, and it's not entirely clear. I don't think when the contracts, when the testing is going to resume. So the testing's suspended, not the contract. Um, so the seven-month extension to licences was announced yesterday. I've applied and told I need the Specsavers test, but DVLA are not able to request this at this time. Do I have seven months or are they likely to get back earlier? Do you know much about that kind of process at the moment? No, I've, I've got to put my hands up there, Jenna. That's probably beyond our, my, my scope in advising <laughs> TVLA. Uh, it, but it's a fantastic question. I wish I did have an answer to that yeah. um, because we're going to meet more and more of our patients who have that problem. I, I'm, I'm glad the DVLA have extended the license that's very sensible because clearly you can't go ahead and do the, the standard tests at the moment it's just not safe so um 
and that only came out yesterday that announcement by the sounds of things so yeah i think it was a few days before but possibly by the time yeah yeah, yeah. reach consumers but, so hopefully that's going to give us enough time to work our way through the, through the pandemic and then get back to business as normal but i, I can't be certain about that so the um i think the update that we've had from dvla is as long as you've done your bit and you have put in your renewal into the system then you've you sort of done absolutely what you can so there is actually a section of uh the road act 88 or something that that allows for that that if there's a kind of delay in the system but you've done your bit you are okay um so i don't know how long you'll you know sit, everything is a bit is delayed at the moment um and and no one can quite know sort of when when services will get back to anything approaching normal but as long as you've done your bit and you've reapplied and you've sort of put your your application into the system um don't you know don't worry you've, you've done your best Presumably, it's possible to arrange your own field test if, if there is a safe place for that to be done, and then yeah. then send it in independently. Yes, yes, I think you can. But whether they will um, get on to that, the, the, the DVLA's focus at the moment is um, commercial drivers and, and kind of key workers and that whole kind mm. of process of, unfortunately, you as a kind of a, a person with glaucoma, um, driving for your own purposes, you're you're sort of in their to-do list, and they just won't, you know, they won't be prioritising you. I'm afraid at the moment, but that means that just means you've done if you've done your bit and you've sent your application yeah. off, um, you know, you, you can't do anything more than that. So you are allowed to be driving, even if your licence says it's expired. Um, police will 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 not. Um, um, another slightly different question. So you haven't mentioned loss of contract and in particular comorbidities such as cataract resulting in um, glare and, and sort of in yeah. vision. So, yeah, very fair point. Uh, loss of contrast, presumably contrast sensitivity. <clears throat> yeah. So I did, I, I alluded in, in the World Health Organization statement, I sort of alluded to the fact that there are many other factors that have an influence on our driving, not just our vision, but uh, all kinds of other uh, lighting and, and other factors affecting our ability to respond quickly. Um, and I've really just talked about the visual field defects because that's what the that's what the DVA make their decision based on. But of course, there are other disease processes that can affect the eye. So you can have a combination of problems. So you could have cataract, uh, you could have age-related macular degeneration, you know, something like common underlying diseases, all of that could have an influence on your visual function. So the DVLA have uh, one definition of, 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 of visual acuity for central vision. So that's what you can read on the Snellen chart. And then they have a, another definition of visual fields, which is what I mentioned. Um, they, they also uh, have definitions of reduced contrast sensitivity, particularly for the group two drivers, um, vision in twilight, various terms that came in through the European Union uh, um, law about driving. So our driving laws are based on what the European Union driving law was, which was pretty similar to our driving law uh, before the European Union came came up with theirs. Uh, but there were some slight modifications and they brought some of these terms in, terms that we in the panel have found very difficult to uh, be able to define properly. So what is twilight, difficulty in twilight, vision what is um how do you define contrast sensitivity well you can measure contrast sensitivity on a chart called a Pelly robson chart but it's not a very freely available one and that's not we don't feel the spirit of what they were asking for what they're really asking for is you know are you having difficulty seeing um curb edges in 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 dim light uh, you know that's all contrast sensitivity and it's, it's very difficult to measure so apart from asking an individual are they having glare? Are they having uh, loss of contrast sensitivity, difficulty driving in twilight? Then there isn't really another formal test for those measurements. Well, they, there, there are systems in place, but then they're not really used in clinical practice. So they're not practical. So I accept that there are multiple other problems with the rest of with your eye, other diagnosis, with your reactions, everything else that can influence your ability to drive. But the DVLA just try to be fairly black 
black and white about this, as far, particularly as far as this condition glaucoma is concerned and, what you, and how that tends to affect your field of vision. I'm sorry for such a rambling answer, but... Uh, <laughs> Where it's, where it gets a bit grey, isn't it? So it's hard to yeah. Um, so a, another question about the actual testing of the Astroman test. Are bifocal lenses suitable? So can you advise people on glasses? So, so the DVLA say just wear what you wear for driving, which is obviously distance vision tests. And you don't normally wear distance glasses for um, for these um, a, a distance task, but the, but you do for for your for the DVLA estimate test, <clears throat> and if you drive in your bifocals, then that's probably what you should wear. And the central part of the field test that's important that I was showing should fall quite a long way away from where the bifocal reading ad is, so you you should be able to pass the test. And even so, the light is quite bright, so even if you're not seeing it clearly, uh, most people will still be able. To press the button to say they've seen it even though it's not as clear as it might have been so yes you should wear your bifocals if that's what you wear for normal driving um another question about specs so if you if you ask for a copy of the chart can are they under an obligation to share it with you the printout of the estimate you know Daleky on me there. Um, yeah, yeah. Likewise, I'm going to turn my video. I'm going to turn my video off in case that's part of the problem. So okay. it's only your video. So uh, I don't think Specsavers, from my experience, Specsavers won't normally give you a copy of the test. In fact, they don't really want to engage in any uh, decision making about how you've done. They'll just say thank you, that's done. We'll send it off. And there is some cost in printing it off the printing side of things. So I, I think they, under their regulations, they say that they won't give you a copy, which is perhaps a bit mean spirited, but I think is, is the situation. I, I, I do have some patients who come back uh, with a copy uh, from asking me to have a look at. So I, I suspect there's a, a bit of a variation across the Specsavers uh, brand, but, um, Sadly, I don't think they're obliged to give you a copy. That's okay. my understanding. Anna, do you have any, any other? Uh, so I've actually got a, a word in my ear here that, that is clarifying that if they um, they do have to share it with you, actually, it's your personal data. Um, so if you ask, oh. um, yeah, so there we go. Sounds great. Yes. Yeah, um, if, yeah, if you ask for it, they do have to share it with you. Um, great. OK. Your, your personal data. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, your test, yeah, yeah, exactly. Data, yeah. Why not? Your own medical records, can you? Um, I yes, think they. I that that's probably a recent yeah. thing, actually. Yeah. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, sorry. Um, it, how does the DVLA decide whether to do a three or one year extension of your license? Oh, that's a good question. So that's based on how close you are to passing the test. So, if like the one of the ones I showed, it was a, a borderline pass. They would normally give you a one year. So if you're one point away or you're very close to a fail, they would give you a one year license. But in general, they're going to give you three years if you've done well on the test. So the other example I gave would have been a three year example, a three year extension. OK, great. Um, and this may be, um, again, I don't know whether you're able to help with this. If, if in any appeal, would there be scope for any non-visual factors such as, say, being a carer or is it entirely kind of stats and data driven? based on the visual field? So I have seen some appeals that have come through the DVLA and seen their responses and there's lots of heart rendering reasons as to why people feel that they want to keep their driving license but the DVLA seem to have a completely black and white view on this. Either you pass their test and you can drive or you don't pass it and you can't drive. So that, that, as far as I've observe there's no flexibility in their interpretation of of the rules and th there are some countries around the world where there are grades of driving license so where i gave that example before about uh, people only driving within their local region um, not driving at night not, not going on certain road types 
there are some licenses that some license authorities in other countries that will allow you to have that scope but in the uk the dvla haven't taken that up and it's there's no room in european law for that either so perhaps there's uh, enough of a groundswell for it. So you went a bit, um, a bit, yeah, uh, unclear. Then could you just say the last little bit? Sorry, just repeat the last bit about. The, 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 the bottom, the bottom line is that DVLA don't have any latitude on their interpretation. Mm, right. Okay. Sadly, some countries do. We don't. Right. Yeah. It's where road, they're obviously prioritising kind of patient, well, road safety, presumably. That's the kind of the, what they've decided is the cutoff. I think road safety and a manageable workload for them so they don't, you know, they, they don't have to make difficult decisions, time, to, time consuming decisions on, mm. on multiple cases. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, that's true. Um, so another another word in my ear as well, which is just in terms of if you're having um, a poor experience at Specsavers, do please contact Specsavers as well, either the store you went to or centrally. Um, the DVLA wants to know how, how your experiences have been, but Specsavers do want to improve as well. Um, so yeah, so you've got a lot of letters to write. So to DVLA, Specsavers and us, if you have any um, questions and queries and we can um, uh, do yeah. you know all organizations will, will, will listen and, and act as they can it is like really important though it's the, it's the one thing that makes organizations change it's user feedback yep yep right we've got a few more minutes going so i'm just going to um ask another poll which are the same questions that you did at the start just to see if anything's changed um but in the meantime we've had a couple of questions about whose responsibility is it to kind of notify the the DVLA and who should be telling the patient mm. that they should notify the DVLA. So is it the doctor? Is it the optometrist? Sort of what are the what are the rules around that for professional? Yeah. Well, in the end, it's the it's the it's the patient's or the individual's responsibility to tell the DVLA. So anyone with a diagnosis of glaucoma should consider that they may need to tell the DVLA. They can get advice from their optician or their ophthalmologist and ophthalmologists are as I said in my statement required to just ensure that folks are aware that they need to tell the DVLA but it's not the obligation of the ophthalmologist to tell the DVLA it's the obligation of the individual um, so that's really where the responsibility lies but so I think all of us have got a role to play in that but certainly ophthalmologists have traditionally not been very good at telling uh, folks when they're meant to tell the DVLA. So uh, relying on ophthalmologists to do that uh, will lead to quite a lot of patients missing out. Uh, I think that has improved. Certainly there have been some audits that have showed that it's not particularly, hasn't been particularly good. And when re-auditing is done, there's been some better, at least documentation that the patient's been involved, uh, been informed, sorry. And the same with optometrists if you're going for your eye test and you say you've got, you, you know you tell them you've got glaucoma in both eyes they they should be reminding you that you should be telling the yeah. DVLA um, and, and oh, optometrists you know they'll know the rules and they they should be kind of helping patients um, yeah. and, and also if your glaucoma gets worse then the ophthalmologist should inform you to tell the DVLA because you may have them move from Oh, sorry, you went um you went funny again then. So yeah, basically if your your claim has got yeah, worse, you should you should notify the, the DVLA again. The the optical just needs to needs to help you with that. Yeah. That's right. Um great. Well that's um that's eight o'clock that's time up so i'm sorry that um we haven't answered all of the questions there have been a few more in there that we haven't had time for so very sorry about that i tried to focus on the questions that would be of sort of most interest to um to most people so thank you so much everyone who attended thank you for lots and lots of questions as ever
Um, just a little reminder, this is an, a new program for us to do these support groups. So there will be a survey that, that pops up on your screen at the end um, and you'll get a reminder email tomorrow about that. It'll be really helpful for us to hear what's worked and what's been and what hasn't worked about these, these sessions. We want them to be helpful for you. So yeah. please do take the time to um, to fill in that question. I won't take a long pitch, but three minutes, I think. Um, and thank you again, um, Jonathan, for your time um, and, and answering all those questions. Learning everything. That's enjoyed it. Right. Right, thank you ever so ever so much. Bye everyone, have a good evening.